In the first video of this two-part series, I talked about the power that habits can have in our lives, how they can shape our natural responses to situations, making doing the right thing easier or harder. It should be our goal as Christians not only to do what is good, but to want what is good and for the good to come easy to us. This is not necessarily something that comes naturally, and unless we've lived perfect lives from the moment of our conception, it's likely that we've developed unhealthy spiritual habits, vices, that need to be overcome before we can build virtues. So how do we do that? Well, there's obviously no singular blueprint that works for everyone, but here are four tips that might help you along the way. The first is to start with a spiritual inventory. Evaluate your life and assess what you're dealing with. I counsel college students all the time, either in the confessional or in spiritual direction, and they're pretty familiar at doing an examination of conscience. They come having looked at all facets of their lives and can list out every sin that they've committed. And in one sense, that's great. Knowing your sins will help you know what you have to work on. But at the same time, simply knowing that you have a repetitive sin won't help you get over it. Simply saying, don't do that, doesn't work for most people. The reason for that is because sin is the final result of our behavior. It's step five. But what about steps one, two, three, and four? By the time we've gotten to the point of sin, we've probably taken many tiny steps along the way, put ourselves into poor situations, failed to rely on God for help. If you want to turn from your sin, it's not enough to ask yourself what sins you commit. You have to ask why you commit them. What vices lie beneath? What bad habits weaken your ability to choose the good? The final act of sin might be pornography or masturbation, as it often is, but there's so much more at work here. It starts with how we look at attractive people all day long. It's about how we handle our stress and loneliness. It's about the contributing factors of alcohol, isolation, poor diet, low self-esteem, or laziness that make relying on sin so much easier. When you do your examination of conscience, don't just examine sins, examine vices as well. Just as you routinely look at a list of sins to compare your life, look at the list of vices and evaluate your life against it. Do you ever exhibit cowardice or intemperance, injustice or folly? What about hate, despair, or serious doubt? These things can take on many forms and are not necessarily sinful in themselves, but they're at most one step away. If all you focus on is your sin but ignore the things that lead you to them, you're never gonna be truly converted. Once you've done this, something I recommend that you do as often as you examine your conscience, it's time to set a plan of action to remove them. Luckily for us, each vice has a corresponding virtue to counteract it. Fortitude, temperance, justice, prudence, love, hope, and faith. These are the antidotes to vices. The obvious answer is to replace your vices with virtues, but I don't think it's as simple as that. To trade one for one is a start, but I think if you really want to develop new habits, to really get them to stick, you have to absolutely obliterate your vices by overemphasizing virtue. If you say something hurtful about a person, don't just respond with a single act of love, respond with five acts of love, ten acts of love. And don't just wait for these things to come to you. You acted cowardly and so you say, well, next time I'm going to show more fortitude. No. Actively look for situations to act virtuously. Make virtue an active decision that you choose, that you practice, that you will in your life. Just as athletes train with heavier equipment and repeat a task thousands of times before ever entering a competition, I think we need to train our spiritual lives long before they will be seriously tested. In the ordinary, in the everyday, in the way that we talk with our friends and treat those around us, we need to overemphasize the virtues we want to live by so that when we're not at our best, when things become difficult, the muscle memory of good habits takes over. A simple, practical example of this might simply be smiling and greeting everyone we meet. Don't wait for someone to be nice to you. Don't just be happy to see your friends. Treat every person you see in a day as a blessing. It may feel strange at first, but watch how much easier it becomes when this is your normal way of life to show love even to your enemies. Overemphasize a virtue when it doesn't matter, and it'll shine when it does. That said, it's not enough to become proficient in one virtue and ignore the rest. Since the goodness of God pervades them all, they must work in tandem. Tip three is to incorporate as much consistency in your life as possible. I've often thought that vices are like conspiracy theories. If you fall for one, you are likely to fall for them all. 
the same weakness that gives into folly will not be long behind in giving into despair. When I counsel people struggling with a particular vice or sin, I often ask them how the rest of their life is going. What's your prayer life like? How do you eat? Are you sleeping enough? Keeping up with your schoolwork? What I often find is that there is a problem throughout their lives. Promiscuity may be their outward sin, but lack of impulse control is their vice. The real problem that we need to deal with is the lack of discipline. I say, if you're struggling with one vice in particular, try working on the other vices as well. Try regularizing your life, bringing more consistency. Make your bed in the morning. Eat one cookie, not four. Put your phone away when working. Train your entire life for virtue, not just the most obvious vices, which is, admittedly, a tall order for sure, one that will inevitably fail more than it succeeds. Which brings me to my final point. Have patience with yourself. The fact of the matter is that vices take years to develop. They don't just pop up one day fully formed, and they don't live simply on the surface. Many of our vices have been with us so long that they become ingrained into who we are. That's just how we act. Overcoming vices is not a matter of flipping a switch. It's not something that we can simply will ourselves to let go of and be cured of tomorrow. It takes a lot of persistence. But you know what? Persistence pays off. When I entered Novitiate, I realized that I finally needed to do something about my awful prayer life. It wasn't enough to pray only when I wanted to. My inconsistency was the reason that I felt so lackluster at times. And so what did I do? I got up at 5.55 every morning before the day started to pray in the chapel for 30 minutes. Every day, no matter what. At first, it was awful. I am not a morning person at all. I fought it and I fought it, but I stuck with it. I had perseverance. I stuck with the virtues I was trying to build, even if I didn't feel anything at first. One night, about three months into this routine, I stayed up fairly late for some reason and decided not to set my alarm for the morning. God'll understand, I told myself. It's no big deal, it's just one day. The next morning, I experienced a miracle. 5.55 came, and without even an alarm, I found myself wide awake. Not just awake, wide awake. So awake that I didn't even want to sleep anymore. For me, it was as if God was calling me to prayer, removing all of my obstacles from my path. It was the easiest thing in the world to go up to the chapel. I truly wanted to be there. And I know what some of you will say. It was just your circadian rhythm. You got up at the same time every day, and so it's not a miracle that you got up at that time. You had just trained your body to do so. But you see, that's my point. That's what I've been driving home for two videos. Our habits matter. The way we live, our natural reactions, the routines that we develop, they can either help us follow God or hurt us. At the start of my novitiate, I did not want to get up to pray. I didn't feel anything. I would have much rather slept in than to spend time with God. But after training my flesh, overemphasizing the virtues each and every day, remaining persistent even when it was difficult, I began to feel the fruits of that virtue, that spiritual good habit growing. I now wanted to pray. I had joy in the morning to sit in the chapel with God. I tell you, it is not easy to build virtue like this, and without constantly maintaining it, it can fall away. But it is worth it. It is the very thing we need to be on the road to God. And so, knowing how difficult this road is, I leave you with one of my favorite prayers of all time, a prayer that I have used on this channel before and one that I repeat to myself regularly. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it might take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on, as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting on your own good will, will make of you tomorrow. 
Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete.